The statements expressed in the following program are those of the speaker. They do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the sponsor, the hosts, and or Olas Media. Olas Media. My authority is born on 40 years of experience uh, in the system. The political mess that we have today, where people don't, they stop talking to each other. There's always a bad apple. There's bad lawyers, there's bad doctors, there's bad nurses, there's bad uh, auto mechanics. There are things that the public isn't aware of that they, the public needs to know. Organized crime, it's cartels, it's gangs, and it's a serious problem. The elections ought to be decided when the most people vote. Welcome to the Politic Daily with Dan Howard. First and foremost, tell me, political delicatessen, what is the goal of it, and what can people expect when they tune into it? What we would like to do with the political delicatessen is talk about uh, a variety of political issues that uh, affect Americans across the country, uh, the kinds of issues that you hear about every day, uh, that um, legislatures across the country are making decisions on that affect people's lives. And so we may talk about, uh, for example, um, uh, the uh, illegal drug sales in the country. And I'm not talking about uh, street drugs. I'm talking about pharmaceuticals, the drugs that people buy uh, when they go to their pharmacy, but, when they, but what they don't know is that when they buy it online, the chances are better than 50% that it's a fake pharmacy. Uh, and so we're going to encourage legislatures across the country, uh, hopefully through uh, information like this, um, to go after those uh, fake uh, pharmacies, to go after those things. We're going to talk about uh, the politics of cannabis. Um, in California, very few people understand that 90% of the, the cannabis sales in California are illegal. And it's a serious problem. And when we say illegal, it's not illegal to some kids selling it in high school. It's organized crime. It's cartels. It's gangs, and it's a serious problem because it's putting literally billions of dollars in the hands of the wrong people. Uh, we'll talk about um, <clears throat> abortion, you know, and, and we won't shy away from it. It's the kind of issue that um, it's, it divides people, but it really shouldn't divide people. It should be an issue where people try to understand each other and, and why, they, why they feel the way they do about an issue like that. So... What we want to do is we, want to, we don't want to focus on one thing. Uh, we want to have some very open and honest discussions about the, you know, a variety of issues, just everyday kitchen table kinds of things and how it affects people. And of course, we are the Independent Voter Project, and we'll talk a lot about elections and how elections are run. Uh, we have a very, when we started the Independent Voter Project, it was born out of frustration. Um, my former boss in the California legislature, Steve Peace, and I talked, and we had been uh, part of the legislature what we think is the golden years, uh, when, uh, when politicians worked together, when Republicans and Democrats went out to dinner, and they spent time with each other, and they worked things out. Uh, but it, over the years, it had deteriorated into the political mess that we have today where people don't, they stop talking to each other. Uh, and it's, it's adversarial, and, uh, and it's not good for the country. It's not good for the voters. So we decided that one of the things that we could do was we could, we could make elections more competitive. Uh, we, we, we looked at a variety of issues, but one of the things that we knew from, from the fact that we were involved in politics is that uh, elections in California were being decided in the primaries when the fewest number of people vote. And so our basic philosophy was we think elections ought to be decided when the most people vote. Uh, and by doing that, um, and, uh, we decided that the open primary would be the way to make things more competitive. Um, so we sat down and we started writing and we started raising money and uh, we had an initiative written uh, that gives every Californian an equal opportunity to vote in a primary election and choose the people who will be on the ballot in November, uh, and it doesn't exclude anybody. Uh, and, and we went, in California, we went from the least competitive legislative and congressional elections to the most competitive in the country in one election cycle. 
And the end result of that is that uh, everyone gets an opportunity to choose who, who they vote for, and they're never excluded at any step of the process. And when you have, uh, um, in, in Democratic districts or Republican districts, two members of the same political party are running against each other, that gives an opportunity for independents and the people who are registered in the opposite political party to make a choice. Uh, if you're a Republican, you may, want, you may want to vote for a more moderate Democrat than a progressive Democrat. If you're a Democrat, you may want to vote for a more moderate Republican as opposed to a very conservative Republican. And we give people that opportunity. And we think that, uh, at least for the voters, that's a much better opportunity and it works much better. Uh, California has a more open election process than any uh, state in the union. So then help me understand, tell me this, what makes you the authority to have this podcast? Well, uh, I'm the, um, I, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't quite say I'm the authority, but I, uh, what I can say is that I was there at the beginning and having had uh, at the time, 40 years of experience in politics in California uh, and had worked in elections, uh, seen how our elections were run, um, seen how the legislature uh, functioned when there was competition uh, and people got along with each other versus now when you have people sitting on one side of the aisle and the other and they, and they virtually don't talk to each other. So um, I, m my authority, does, uh, if that's the correct word, is born on 40 years of experience uh, in the system uh, and, and knowing that uh, when, when the least people vote, it's the easiest way to, to rig the system, which is a really overused word these days. Um, because quite frankly, I don't, I don't think uh, elections were ever rigged. Uh, and, and regardless of what people say about 2016 when Hillary Clinton lost, or in 2020 when, when Donald Trump lost. Those elect, they, they didn't lose because the elections were rigged. They lost because they didn't run very good campaigns and their parties didn't get enough voters out. It's that simple. Uh, and uh, in 2020, the Democrats did a much better job turning voters out. And in 2022, they did a much better job turning voters out. And turning voter out, voters out is what it's all about. Uh, that for us, the more people that vote, the better the final decision is. So we, we sit here today and we're <clears throat> surrounded by people from all over the country, from different industries, from different. <clears throat> what benefit is there for, for them to be able to come and have a discussion about what it is in their, in their respective industries here? Let's, let's talk about the politics first. Let's talk about the fact that we have legislators here from California and we have legislators here from Texas, the two largest states in the country. But if you break down the people that live in those states, the demographics are virtually identical. There's very close to the same number of Hispanics, Caucasians, Asians, uh, African Americans. Those numbers are very, very similar. But the politics are very, very different. So uh, what has come out of this, this conference is that legislators from California are learning from legislators in Texas on how they uh, address the issues in their states. The legislatures couldn't be any more different. In California, you have professional politicians, uh, people who are working in the legislature who make uh, well above $100,000 a year to be a legislator. Uh, they're in session from January to September every year. Um, and in Texas, they only go into session every other year for 140 days, and they get, I think, $600 a month. They pay their own expenses to be, so they are, they are what I consider a citizen's legislature, and California is a professional legislature. And there's a lot to be learned by the legislators in sitting down and talking about issues, because they, they deal with things much different in Texas than they do in California. But but the basic issues that they're addressing are same. energy issues. They, both states have similar energy, energy issues. Uh, both states have similar budget issues, tax issues. Uh, both states are big oil producing states and, and they deal with the industry very, very different in both states. In Texas, the oil industry tax uh, goes and funds education. In California, that's not the case. 
Um, in, uh, uh, in California, they, they've been talking about an extraction tax. That's, they have an extraction tax in Texas. Uh, but it goes, to, it goes to pay for kids to go to school. Uh, so th there's a lot of learning that, that, uh, that goes on that way. Now, let's, let's jump forward and let's talk about the, the, the uh, businesses that are attending. <clears throat> I, I spent many, many years as a government affairs representative uh, uh, in a multitude of states, primarily in California, but I, I, I was a government affairs representative for a large pharmaceutical company in Texas and in California at the same time. So I was able to see how both states operated. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's very interesting in terms of how you look at, uh, as a government affairs person, how you look at um, uh, the, the political process. <clears throat> in California, uh, we've gotten to the point in California where uh, the legislators are having fundraisers like every day. In the last two weeks of the legislative session in California, uh, about 10 years ago, maybe no, more than that now, it's probably 15 years ago, um, my lobbyist in California uh, gave me the list of fundraisers that were being held in the last three weeks of the legislative session, when almost all of the legislation is being voted on every single day. And in that three-week three, three period, there were over 200 fundraisers. There's only 100 legislators up for election. And there were 200 fundraisers. And the minimum dollar amount to get into a fundraiser is 1000 bucks. And so, uh, so what, I made, what I did at that time, I made a decision that I'm not going to make contributions to legislators ever again while the legislature is in session. Because I don't think that they should be taking money the day before they vote on an issue that, uh, from the, 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 the industry or whatever that they got the contribution from. Uh, and, and it really is, it's more a matter of perception. I don't think that legislators, for the most part, are corrupt. There's always a bad apple. There's bad lawyers, there's bad doctors, there's bad nurses, there's bad uh, auto mechanics. Um, and and the, when, you have, when the legislator's having a fundraiser, if you're giving them a contribution, there's probably somebody who opposes you that's giving them a contribution too. So that kind of balances itself out. But I think the perception of taking money and then voting on something the next day is just wrong. It's just wrong, and, and it shouldn't do that. Um, and so uh, I, I stopped making contributions. I was one of the very, very few people who did it. I did it very vocally, and, uh, and I, I did not waver. No matter how much pressure, I just said, sorry, I'm not going to do it. Uh, and and uh, I'm not sure that, it, that it, it, it had a big, big impact on the system, but I knew I was doing the right thing. Uh, and that's what we try to do at the Independent Voter Project. We try to do the right thing. Um, and we try to do the right thing for the most people, uh, and that's why, that's why, let's get back to uh, nonpartisan open primaries. We want everybody to have an equal chance to vote and have their vote mean something. When you have a, when you have a partisan primary and you live in a Democratic district, say that this district is 55% Republican and 30, I mean, a Democrat, 35% Republican, and the rest are independent, the election's decided in the primary. And, and if you don't have competition in November, then there, there really is no election in November. It's just, a, it's just rubber stamping it. But when you have competition and you end up with two Democrats on the ticket, the fact of the matter is we've seen as a result of our initiative that the votes of independents and Republicans have a significantly higher impact in the general election because now the two candidates from the same party they have to find a way of appealing to and reaching the independents and the people of the other party because they're going to they're going to have an opportunity to vote for them and choose somebody who is much closer to their political uh, viewpoint. Uh, so we think, <clears throat> well, we don't think we know that that's well, that that's a much better system uh, and it, and it serves the voters uh, much better. Um, we'll talk about. Uh, I, I'd like to have a. A series of podcasts on uh, how to elect a president, because we do it all wrong in this country. We have partisan primaries 
that are controlled by the political parties in states wherever they feel like having the states in the order that they have them. And uh, in independents don't, in, in, in way, way too many states, there's, there's millions and millions and millions of independent voters across the country who do not get the opportunity to voice their opinion on who the presidential candidates of the United States should be. That's flat out wrong. Uh, we're sponsoring legislation, and, and I, I've been twisting arms to try to get somebody to introduce it. But in California, we're going to introduce legislation that has a special ballot for independents. So the Republicans can have their primary election closed. The Democrats can have their primary election closed if they want. But independents will get a ballot in California with every presidential candidate from both parties listed on the ballot. So independents can have the same opportunity to express their opinion. Most people think about, they talk about presidential primary elections. They're not elections. No one gets elected in a presidential primary. Not only do not you not get elected, even if you win a presidential primary in New Hampshire, it doesn't mean you're on the ballot in November. And so uh, just like we did in California with the open primary, we should start with opening the primaries and, and, and getting the political parties to say, we're going to make the decisions based on the most voters that are voting. Um, I think, uh, I, I, regardless of your po political persuasion, I think the Republicans suffer from that the most. Uh, in California, the Democrats, uh, and I, I talk about California because that's, that's my home political base, and I, and I spent nearly 50 years in politics in California. Um, but in California, the, the, the Democrats for a long time have allowed independents to choose and ask for a Democratic ballot without having to re-register. Um, and presidential primaries are, you can call them uh, beauty contests, or you could say that they're, they're um, the biggest political poll and the most accurate political poll in terms of of the, the people who are registered in the particular political party. Because that's when people go and they actually vote. Um, you know, uh, these days, uh, politics has, have become so divisive that uh, pollsters have a very difficult time getting some people to, to respond to polls. So polls are less accurate than they used to be. Uh, and, and I've talked to a lot of pollsters about this. Uh, a couple of things uh, that have happened uh, in the last 10 to 15 years. First of all, uh, a lot more people don't have landlines in their homes anymore. And so they're calling people on their mobile homes, on their, mo their mobile phones. And uh, uh, the response from people with mobile phones is significantly lower than people who have landlines. Um, and uh, so, so that's, that's a, for pollsters, that, that's, that's a real problem. And then the other thing that's happened, as politics have become more divisive, people don't want to answer the polls anymore. Uh, and and you, get a, you get a significant portion of people in each political party who are very leery about expressing themselves even to someone uh, who is uh, anonymous on the phone. They don't want to, they, you know, Everybody, everybody thinks these days that somebody's listening in on every conversation they have. You know, just ask Alexa. You know, go, go in the house, talk about uh, you, that you need a new vacuum cleaner, and pretty soon Alexa's sending you uh, uh, um, information on your iPad or your iPhone about um, the latest Dyson vacuum cleaner. Uh, it, 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 and which brings me to, uh, to the, 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 another thing that we think is uh, a real serious uh, long-term problem for democracy in this country. And that is uh, the sophistication of data. Um, if, you, uh, if you get into the bowels of the tech, uh, the tech industry, in, uh, they have more information and more data uh, on people than they did. You know, uh, it's exponentially larger than it was two years ago or four years ago or six years ago. And the algorithms are incredibly unsophisticated. Um, 
they, they use those algorithms to send you information that, that tells you which magazine they, they, they think that, you're, and the, uh, that you want to buy, or which car, or which pair of shoes, or whatever. We all get those, uh, those things. Well, those are very sophisticated algorithms, and all that information is used to um, create uh, personality types. And with those algorithms, they can these days, uh, with a, a very, very high probability, predict who you're going to vote for. And so uh, political campaigns are going to change in the future. They're not going to be the kinds of campaigns where you're, you're uh, reaching out to everyone. Uh, if, you're, if you're a Republican candidate in the future, uh, you'll have a category of Republicans who vote in every single election. They vote in every primary. They vote, in every, and when they do that, you know, based on their history, they're going to vote for a Republican. So you don't bother to talk to them anymore because you already have them. So where where do you go and you mine the most votes? You go to people who don't vote, and you use your algorithms to accurately predict who they're going to vote for. Uh, and there are hundreds hundreds of thousands of those kinds of people. Uh, uh, people who um, are in we call them inactive voters, uh, and uh, between <clears throat> the algorithms that give you the the uh, ability, uh, let, let's let's just put it in terms of uh, of numbers. Uh, the accuracy is probably eighty percent that they can predict who somebody's going to vote for. So if you have a hundred thousand inactive voters. Uh, and you can get them to vote out of a uh, you know, out of say two hundred thousand. You want to get you want to try to get fifty percent turnout. Um, you know that you're with with the right algorithm. You can you you don't have to campaign on behalf of a candidate. You don't have to do anything that is reportable to any government agency on the money that you spend. Because you know, if you get them to vote, you're going to have an eighty percent chance of getting their vote. So if you if you reach a hundred thousand people. You're going to get 80,000 votes, and the other guy's going to get 20, and you have a net 60,000 gain. Well, in every swing state, every swing state in the presidential election in 2020, where this process was used extensively for the first time, uh, uh, the entire, the, 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 every single one of those states was decided by less than 60,000 votes. So there are, uh, the, the, at, the, at the, the bottom line, if you go and you do the analysis, the presidential election in 2020 uh, was decided in eight states by less than 150,000 votes out of you know, tens of millions of votes cast. 40, 42 states are either Republican or Democrat, and, and there's no question about the outcome. And then you have eight states where uh, the margin of victory is 10,000, 12,000 votes, uh, you know, 15,000 votes. And if you can turn out 25 or 30,000 more voters who normally don't vote than the other party, you win. Uh, and that happened in 2020. The, the, and, and it's legal. And there's nothing, uh, there's nothing illegal about it. It's not immoral. It's just that somebody controls the data. And somebody has the money. So if you take a, a very rich, I won't name any names or any companies, but if you take a very, very rich CEO of a company who can afford to uh, spend four, uh, north of $400 million in eight states uh, and, and has the ability to set up um, C3 nonprofits and the data to go along with it, they can determine who the next president of the United States is. And they don't have to campaign to millions of people in, on networks. Uh, they don't have to do co political campaign ads. In fact, they don't ever even have to mention the name of the candidate that they're supporting. They already know they support that candidate. The goal then is to just get them to go vote. And the Democrats have done a much, much better job of that. The Republicans are uh, probably a decade behind in terms of understanding uh, technology. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and so that's a deadly combination of, I shouldn't say deadly combination, it, it's, a, it's a powerful combination of data, uh, organization, and money. Uh, and when you, have, when you have that kind of uh, uh, resources and you know how to use them, then you, you can campaign to 500,000 people 
never tell them the candidate you're supporting and affect the, ele the outcome of the election of the president of the United States. And it happens. It's not, this is not, this isn't, you know, uh, 1984 fantasy uh, stuff. This is real. This is, this, and this is, has happened and it's documented. Uh, and so I think uh, the future of democracy can be, uh, is in danger because there are, a, there are a very small number of people who are billionaires, have the data, and have, the have people with the political expertise to do this without having to report a single do dollar to the, and, and to have the public ever know what's going on. So now let's bring it full circle. <clears throat> how, does, how does said name, political delicatessen, impact just the, an issue like that alone? How, give me that. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's focus on the 2020 presidential election and all the, uh, all the, uh, the, the talk show, the talking heads, the, the press and everyone else and, uh, and all of the people who uh, are convinced, absolutely convinced that the election was rigged, that the machines were rigged and all of those things. Well, that's not true. Uh, the election, it, it, it wasn't rigged, it was bought and paid for. Uh, it was, uh, and, and so uh, there are things that um, the public isn't aware of uh, uh, that they, the public needs to know about. Public needs to know that Alexa is listening to them. And if they're having a conversation in their kitchen about the presidential election, somebody knows about that. And that goes into a data bank, and now you're a prime candidate for someone who is going to make sure you get, get out to vote. Uh, let's, let's use the data, for example. Uh, uh, you can, you can cross-reference the voter file with the Department of Motor Vehicles. You can, uh, on a daily basis, find out who's voted and who hasn't. So if you know that uh, Jane Smith, a Republican, has already voted, if, you, if you're the right company, you also know all of Jane Smith's friends because they're on Jane Smith's page. So you can then cross-reference all, all the people on Jane Smith's page to see if they're registered voters and if they've voted yet. And if they haven't, you can encourage Jane Smith to tell all their friends to vote. Don't forget to vote. Uh, and there, there are studies that have been done for the last 10 years on the impact of getting people who don't normally vote to vote using social media pressure, which we didn't, it never existed before. Uh, and uh, uh, there's one study that uh, I think it was University of Pennsylvania uh, did. Uh, it might have been Princeton, but uh, it, it was one or the other. And uh, they did an experiment. They had a control group and they had a, uh, another group that was simply encouraged through social media to go vote. And the increase in the turnout from the, versus the, control, the control group versus the, uh, the group that was impacted by social media was a 32% increase in, in turnout. So for every 100,000 people that they're reaching out to, they're getting 32,000 people to vote. And don't forget what I said earlier. They already know who they're going to vote for. So, uh, um, when you have that kind of, when you have that kind of, um, those resources again and that power, uh, you don't have to run campaigns uh, the way the political parties run. You know, you let the political parties go do their thing and go after each other, and you very subtly in the background, uh, you spend your time focusing on a very, very small universe of voters with lots and lots of messaging. And the social media messaging uh, is, is really, really impactful. Uh, um, uh, someone, one of your friends sending you uh, uh, a, 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 a post that says, I voted, please go out and vote, exercise your right to vote. That has a much bigger impact than uh, any candidate saying, vote for me. Uh, you're not, uh, the, oh, the most successful way uh, in order to get somebody to vote is not to try to uh, uh, convince them of something, uh, or a candidate, or something. it's to convince them that they, they need to exercise their right to vote without, without being uh, politically partisan about it, without saying, I want you to go, Joe, go vote for Joe. That's far less successful than 
please go vote. Exercise your right as a citizen. Please go vote and make your own decisions. Uh, and when people are free to make their own de decisions, they're much more likely to go make that decision. This is Dan Howell. I'm the executive director and the chairman of the board of the Independent Voter Project, uh, an organization that was founded in 2006 with the intention of empowering independent voters and doing everything we can to give them the opportunity to vote in every stage of the election process. And we've been successful in doing that, and we do it across the country, and we're very proud of it. This episode was produced by Olas Media Podcast Network in San Diego, California, with Elia Ramos as Creative Director, Jessica Garcia as Project Manager, JC Polk as Executive Producer, Lina Alvarez as Associate Producer, and Chad Pease as President and Co-Founder. Welcome to the Politic Daily with Dan Howell. Olas Media.